Okay, let's get started. Hi, I'm Steve Barton, uh, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives with Northern California Grant Makers. I hated to end one of my uh, favorite uh, old school songs right there. It's kind of getting into it, but I want to welcome you to uh, this morning's breakout. Thank you for joining us. Um, this session is called Pushing the Envelope for a Better California. Um, I think we can safely say the last year and a half has been incredibly challenging for us all. Um, and the work we started on Better California, which has been a couple of years now, um, feels like it's never been more vital and important. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is an effort to align philanthropy around a common vision of what the state of California could be for all of its residents. And the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on communities of color, the violence against black and Asian folks, the assault on our democracy and the racist undertones and overtones really sh show how the work of this Better California has never been more important and vital than it is right now. Better California Alliance philanthropy around a shared vision of an equitable and just state. It highlights the role philanthropy can play in achieving that vision and works to unlock the myriad resources of philanthropy to be actors and supporters of long-term change. Most keenly through funding the movement building ecosystem and infrastructure. So many funders have taken on deep work strategies and practices over the last year in response to the pandemic and have done incredible work to advance equity. The roots of much of this work, as you will hear, predate the events of last year. But the last year that we've had has set the stage and provided the context to accelerate this work. Philanthropy California has published a playbook that outlines many of the practices that you'll hear today and gives you important information to help achieve them. And each of these leaders and institutions have activated multiple areas of this playbook to respond to this unprecedented year and the work that they've done to <laughs> So I'm gonna turn it over to um, our project, Better California Project Lead, Cassandra Benjamin, to walk us through a short poll about how your work has been different over the last year. Great, thank you, Steve. And welcome all, I see people are still joining in. Um, we're gonna launch a quick live poll with two parts. And really before we hear from our panelists about the ways they've pushed the envelope, we wanna understand from those of you who are in our virtual room, what you might've done differently in this last year. So if we can set up, set the poll up coming up, there we go. So this is really about what did you do for either the first time in your institution or you just did it way more than you ever have. Please click, check all boxes that apply. So if you just started doing general oper operating grants in the last year, or you did like triple as many as normal, you would check that box. And so if you can all uh, go through that and then hit submit, and when we get sort of a critical mass, we'll show the results of how many of your institutions did something pretty dramatically different in this last year and in what areas. And again, feel free to check as many as apply. All right, and here are the results. All right, so um, it looks like that streamlining of grant making processes and timeframes, so to every, the majority of you um, really jumped on but a ton of activity as well in terms of the focus on racial equity, increasing grant amounts and general operating grants. So the next question is the companion to this. It's which of these things that for anything you checked yes the first time, which are you now doing going forward? Which have you changed? You now are gonna keep doing way more general operating grants or stay at that heightened grant award level or stay at these new racial equity grants. So just check the ones that your institution who has committed to doing for the, for the longer haul past this first year. And again, as many as apply. Pretty excited to see the results of this one. This is the hard one. <laughs> um, and something our panelists will be discussing um, as well. So hopefully folks are getting those in and the results are in, wow. 
That's that's pretty significant of how many of these changes weren't just for the year, but really switched up what you all were doing. Um, and that's a great um, opener for Steve to then introduce our panelists who are going to talk about their their um, successes and challenges in this arena. Thanks, Cassandra. So I'd like to introduce the folks we'll be talking with this morning. Um, Judith Bell, Chief Impact Officer for the San Francisco Foundation and someone I've known for a long time. I spent a lot of time at uh, Judith's former uh, place of employment at Policy Link. Uh, that was like a, a weekly or at least every two weeks I would be there. Uh, Serena Khan, CEO of the Women's Foundation of California. And we recently had Serena talking about some of the work uh, she was doing over last year as well. Um, and Judy Larson, Managing Director in the CEO Office of the California Endowment and another uh, close friend of NCG's. I refer you to their bios on the conference website to learn more about these incredible leaders and the work that they've been doing um, for some time now. So I have a few questions to start us off and then uh, all of you listening, when you have questions, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll have time at the end uh, for audience questions, um, unless something pops up that, that Cassandra sees that just needs and begs to be asked in the moment. So one of the reasons we ask each of you uh, to participate today is the history you and your foundation have of embracing change and taking risk in order to achieve racial equity and justice. And particularly the unprecedented changes you made this year in light of the pandemic and its disproportionate impacts, the broader racial justice reckoning that we've experienced, as well as the threats to our democracy. So I'd like to start off with each of you sharing more about your bold idea, what sparked them, what your goal was for instituting them, and what you actually did. So if we could, I'd like to start with you, Serena, and your work at the Women's Foundation to provide fast, flexible, and sustainable funding and reduce barriers for grantees and all areas of support, uh, racial, economic, and gender justice. If you could give us a little bit of the flavor of what you did, why, and how. Great, well, thank you, Steve, and thank you to everybody at NCG for um, hosting this conversation and for inviting us to be in conversation together. I'm really looking forward to the uh, next uh, several uh, minutes um, and the, the time that we have together. So first of all, let me say that um, I, I am happy to say that in the two polls that we were able to answer uh, yes to all of the above. So we um, were able to increase our support, but also um, we were doing all these practices before. And so what it has done for us is really reaffirmed and solidified um, uh, that we need to continue in this way. And so what I will say is that the Women's Foundation California was really founded on a, 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 a principle by our founders that people closest to the problems are closest to the solutions. And so what COVID did for us was to, you know, underscore that it's no longer business as usual. And so what we asked ourselves as a team was if it's no longer business as usual, then what does business as unusual look like? And we really allowed ourselves to open up and think big and, um, you know, present some bold ideas. Uh, and we knew that that needed to start with our team. So as soon as we started working from home and sheltering in place last March, it was March 9th for us, um, we looked at what what we needed for our team to be supported and we began to really or not so much began but really deepened our um, commitment to centering wellness and leading from abundance um, and so you know there's nothing like a pandemic to underscore the importance of focusing on the wellness of our team and our partners and so we were looking for best practices policies and removing barriers for our team and and our partners so um, we like to think of ourselves as a movement accountable foundation we're a publicly supported foundation which means we're accountable to the public the public of community partners that we support and the public of donors that support us um, and so in that vein you know we have a commitment to being majority people of color led at the staff level the board level our program partners are majority people of color women of color in particular, um, our Women's Policy Institute fellows, 
Um, so values alignment is really important in terms of being able to make some of these um, changes. And so everything that we do from our programs and internal practices, you know, that means where we bank, where we're investing our um, resources, where we order catering from when we're able to gather um, together in person. Um, and it flows to our trust-based grant making, and we, but we also have a trust-based approach to uh, managing our team. So that means that, you know, we, in, in, you know, last March went to a four day work week uh, to center the wellness of our team for us to be able to process everything that was happening, but also to really um, be, you know, foster creativity. And so what, uh, what I can say a year plus in the rear view mirror is that we have outperformed every goal that we set for ourselves by moving to a four day work week. Um, and that's something that we expect to continue. That's gonna be institutionalized along with some of these other practices. So let me just talk a little bit about our, um, you know, grant making. We wanted to remove barriers for our partners as well. And so um, our director of community investment uh, published a blog post earlier this week. And there are four sort of categories that Hung Nguyen Yap, who leads our grant making, really looks for, which is ask for what's needed and leave the rest behind. Trust the experts, stay curious and connected, and expedite. So that means for us tangibly that we removed all unnecessary questions from our grant application and left an open comment space instead, making it clear that folks can provide us with as little or as much information as they want in their responses. Um, reporting, we um, don't require grant partners to submit a form that we created. They can uh, send us what they think captures their work best, whether it's a video, whether it's a strategy paper, a series of op-eds, um, and they can talk to us on the phone because one of the hallmarks of our foundation is the deep relationships that we have um, with the communities that we support. And then the third thing is instead of focusing on proven strategies or traditional organizations, we can be open to investing in projects that are new or experimental. And that's been a big part of our history. We were the first funder of California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, the Community Water Center, the Young Women's Freedom Center. And this past year, we've um, provided support for new organizations like Feed Black Futures in Los Angeles, Community Advocates for Just and Moral Governance, and Black Wellness and Prosperity. And then finally, the fourth thing is that we're in regular conversation with our board members, with our grant partners, our WPI alum network, and asking who should we be funding? Who do we need to know about? Because we want um, ours to be a non-competitive process. Um, and so we, you know, we don't want people to apply for funding to be declined. So um, we don't do an RFP, but we have an open process, which means if you call us, we will talk to you and we'll figure out whether it's a good fit. And then um, the, the last thing that, well, two more things that I want to say, and then I'll pause, um, is that we did away with our grant agreement, that that became a barrier. Uh, people, even though we use DocuSign um, to make it easier, grant partners were taking a long time to get back to us. And so we realized there's no legal reason for a grant agreement. We can issue an award letter and say, by accepting these funds, you agree to the following. Um, and just um, a point on the general operating support that was discussed in the great debate previously is that we have trained the sector um, to apply for project funding. So even though on our website, we say, um, you know, we prefer to make general operating support grants, we will also consider project support grants. Several years ago, we the majority of the requests we got were all project support. And so we went back to each organization and said, wouldn't you rather have general operating support? And they said, yes. So that was really um, a surprise for me. And then the last thing I will say is that it's really important for us as a movement accountable organization um, to have movement approval. So our strategic framework is vetted by our community partners. Um, our board includes um, activists and leaders who are either our grant partners or Women's Policy Institute alums, as well as people with high net wealth. And so that is also important that we have movement leaders strategizing with us. Um, so I'll pause there and thank you so much for that question, Steve. Thank you so much, Serena. Um, I really loved hearing uh, about the approaches you all have used over the last year but, and in your history. Um, I know that the thing that, that uh, of the many things you said, uh, I really like uh, uh, the statement you made 
about asking for what's needed and leave the rest behind. Um, that is such an important uh, approach and way of doing of doing the work, rather than having folks kind of give you you know all reams of paper or pages that really don't uh, provide anything extra, uh, really aren't necessary. Uh, next, Judith, uh, I'd like to turn to you. You've been a policy advocate uh, throughout your career, and you brought that orientation to your work at the San Francisco Foundation. Um, how has the San Francisco Foundation worked in new ways this year? Um, and, uh, and since you've been there, to leverage its own influence and networks and partner with movement building groups and support inclusive democracy and long-term policy change. Thanks, Steve, and thanks to NCG. And uh, thank you, Serena. I just learned quite a bit listening to you, so that was terrific. Uh, and I'm tempted to go where you went, but I am gonna answer the question here. Uh, and I just wanna start by grounding in um, the work of the San Francisco Foundation and our North Star around uh, moving towards greater racial equity and economic inclusion. And that that has been this journey that we're on. And actually the journey has been in partnership with leaders uh, from communities of color and with movement builders. And so we knew 2020 was gonna be a big year. It really represented for us a deep commitment uh, to big changes that these groups had committed to uh, really more than 10 years uh, previously. Uh, groups like California Calls and their members, the Million Voter Project and their members right around the region and around the state that I identified uh, really the change in uh, Prop 13 to change the commercial property provision to bring greater resources to communities, greater resources to schools. And so we really um, in partnership with these groups, made a commitment, wanted to come in early and to come in a big way. Uh, you know, as a public charity, uh, we can do both C3 and C4 investments. And so we started um, early um, in that campaign. And you know, what, what COVID did was it actually could have slowed us down. It could have sent us in other directions because as a community foundation, right, we center community we center communities of color and we are um, in conversation and in partnership. And so with COVID, there was this enormous explosion of need. I mean, just the depth of need, the depth of crisis that communities were facing. So we had to gin up support. We had to work with our donors. We had to get that work going, even as we stayed committed to the work in partnership with movement builders. We looked in the work um, in COVID to see how it could also be in partnership with movement, to see how those groups were meeting needs, but we stayed um, very focused on the work around the 2020 election, uh, looking to see what we could do and really thinking about all the roles we could play. Yes, as grant makers, of course, so bringing resources, but then we stepped up in ways we haven't before. So we partnered with the other community foundations in the region. So with the East Bay Community Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, we did something that you would not see community foundations do very often, which is we brought all of our donors together. We brought our donors together to learn about what was pending, to learn about uh, schools and communities first and to think about themselves as uh, donors, donors that could be both moving C3 resources and on their own moving C4 resources as well. And then we joined with other funders who were looking from around the state, how they could be helpful both as institutions and uh, to be garnering uh, resource, resources from individual donors. So really looking to be organized as philanthropy, even as we are supporting the groups, right, who are movement builders and our organizers. And that again was unprecedented because this was an example where communities of color their leaders had drafted the initiative, were leading the effort, were leading the effort uh, to get the signatures, get it on the ballot, and to do all this then in the COVID environment, where the ground game, the most important sort of secret weapon, was really tied up in knots as people were acting responsibly. So just a lot of effort to help um, think through how the, how the strategy needed to shift and how philanthropy needed to shift along with it. Uh, and so we were then also bringing our own voice where it was helpful, uh, speaking out um, when asked. So for instance, there was a lot of organizing for black leaders in the context of the campaign. So Fred Blackwell, our CEO joined in that. 
uh, there were other times where uh, it was useful for us to use our voice uh, and to bring our leadership as a community foundation uh, into, that, into that effort. Uh, and so it, it really, um, it was in many ways this big leap forward for us, thinking about our role as a public charity, thinking about how we could uh, be in partnership with movement builders and how we could help on this fight really that had been, you know, characterized as the political third rail, it had been characterized as you can't take it on, you can't win. And even though the campaign um, in the end lost, it lost by a small amount. And it really then um, was this message, it's not a third rail, it is a debate the state needs to have. And it is a debate that can be led uh, by leaders of color and where they can bring uh, the power of their community, they can bring the power of building movement, they can bring the power of organizing to this very important debate about the future of the state and about the future of the state really being about uh, greater racial equity, greater economic inclusion and greater power in that context. Thanks, Judith. Um, really leveraging all of the resources that the foundation had at, at its disposal to really advance your work, your, your money, your voice, your influence, your partnership is, um, I think, incredibly um, inspiring and uh, really lifts up all the ways that philanthropy can play and can do its work. Thank you for that, Judith. Um, and finally, Judy, you and TCE have harnessed the power of your assets in a, in a brand new way, um, leveraging um, these funds to free, free up significant new capital. Uh, 300 million, I think, is what I heard as the number. Um, to add to your annual grant making over the next few years um, and really um, provide some uh, infrastructure kind of support, as I understand it, um, to the folks that you're uh, planning to support or will support uh, over the next few years. Could you share more about what drove TCE to do this, the impact that you hope it will generate in terms of um, the many issues arising from uh, this last year, and um, uh, is this something you're going to do again? <laughs> do you, can, can you imagine doing that again? Thanks, Steve and um, Serena and Judith. It's just an honor to be on this panel with you. And um, so just thank you all for, for the time. And good morning, everyone. My name is Judy Larson, Managing Director um, at the California Endowment. And I do want to just back up. Um, I will answer that question, Steve, but also back up in terms of we're 25 years old. Just think back of when you individually you were 25 we've grown and changed a lot um as an as an I organization and, back, Judy. and foundation and <laughs> you can't remember, yeah me neither um and it's also to the credit of people like judith bell that the endowment was created um in the first place and um you know when i think about um how much we've changed and grow it's really around what is the long-term um change that we all want to see for for our families our neighbors, our friends, um, as a native California and the state that I live in, and raise my children in. And so really that's sort of our, our orientation in terms of how we show up as a, as a health foundation with, with limitations, I will say that. Um, but our approach really is around how do we build relationships and trust, um, recognizing with humility um, and respect that we're just one entity, we're one partner. We are not gonna solve um, these huge societal problems that have been with us for centuries, um, that we have to have a long long view as we sort of know um, what last year was for all of us. It was, it was heartbreaking, it was um, challenging. That we have to really focus both on place and race, um, that our, our commitment to racial equity cannot be unwavering. If we're gonna say those words, we actually have to change the way that we're gonna show up in community. Um, and that we have a commitment to the 700 organizations that we fund up and down and across this wonderful state. Um, and so just really want to sort of orient that is our, our approach and, and things that we will fail and we will also succeed in. And, you know, entering sort of um, this work around the bond with sort of a recognition of that. In 2020, we launched our Building Healthy Communities work. It was a 10-year commitment. Um, it was an effort to do deep place-based work as well as um, statewide policy work. We learned so much because we listened to partners and leaders on the ground. They told us what we needed. We were willing to hear what they needed um, and we continue to forge um, strong relationships with them. As you also know, um, last year was, was hard for more reasons than we can all probably um, understand and explain. Um, uh, it's 
just a privilege to have leadership um, both at the at the staff level, the executive level, and the board level that said that we cannot, we have to do more. We have to do more to support the power building ecosystem. At that time, there were um, many foundations, mostly national foundations, that were um, going forth and seeking bonds. Um, and it was really um, under sort of the banner around how do we just um, support nonprofits and groups to weather the storm, the storm that we never would have anticipated. Serena, when you were saying um, May, uh, March 9th, we went into uh, shelter in place March 12th, and I was like, we'll be back in a month. <laughs> There's no way we're going to, you know, now we're, what, 14 months in, into this. Um, so we decided that the social bond um, was represented an opportunity to complement, not take over our long-term work. Um, it was intended, we, we still have all intentions to support um, things like general operating support, impact investing work, and the bond is a piece of that puzzle, not, not a, you know, not a whole separate strategy. Some of the overall um, priorities for us in the bond are around racial justice, around supporting a power building ecosystem. And again, really, um, what are the things that we can accelerate, deepen and amplify with these bond resources that we can never do with one grant to one organization? And so we are balancing sort of both the, the long view, um, the different competing ideas <laughs> um, that we have from um, staff, partners, the executive team to really see how can we utilize this bond in a way that um, is a one-time allocation of, you were right, um, Stephen, $300 million um, that we will have to repay um, and, and use that in concert with our long-term grant making, in concert with our impact investing, and in concert and partnership with folks on this panel and, and partners on the ground. We um, anticipate the bond will uh, be connected to um, three programmatic areas, our health system work. Um, we were created um, because we are a health foundation. So we wanna see that everyone in California has coverage. It's not acceptable that undocumented or undocumented neighbors don't have coverage or other people don't have the same coverage that we still have a social determinants approach. Um, so healthcare and health system uh, is still a target for us continuing to deepen our power building ecosystem and really looking at how do we center organizing and base building along with other core elements um, to move sort of a stronger, Judith, what you were sharing earlier around schools and communities first, how do we do that, not on just one area, but across multiple areas to really you know, demand fundamental shifts in resources and systems um, that are serving people, the people they're supposed to serve. And then a focus on disaster resilience and recovery. Um, we, on top of everything else, made significant um, grant uh, resources to partners up and down across the state um, just, to, just to provide direct relief um, to farm workers and um, people of color who were struggling um, just to survive. Um, so those are the three programmatic areas. We are in the... Um, middle of, we have not allocated any of the resources planning to um, how to allocate those resources. Again, with those three overarching priority areas in mind, racial justice, power building, and alignment with our long-term work. Thank you, Judy. Um, this is such a far reaching and exciting idea that you all are pursuing, freeing up additional resources that can be brought to bear on racial equity and on the issues you're working on. Thank you for that. Um, now, you all talked about your kind of your big idea, and I'm sure you heard in the comments of one of our other panelists an idea that it's like, oh, yeah, we're doing that, too. Um, any reactions to what kind of what you've heard from one another? Where where is there overlap? Um, where is there something you want to learn a little bit more about from, from what you've heard so far? Well, I, I will say, I think I see a lot of sort of like overarching thematic, you know, um, overlap, which is that we all um you know took the moment seriously and did things differently um in terms of like the bond in terms of community foundations getting their donors together um that's really powerful and i think for us um you know one of the things that i neglected to mention is that we also in addition to sort of like streamlining and all those things that we really should have done years ago as a sector 
Um, in addition to that, we really, um, you know, were responsive to the moment. So we recognized early in the pandemic that domestic violence rates were spiking in every one of California's 58 counties. Um, and so, you know, we, we, the first thing we did was to, you know, our team asked, do we have resources to get supplemental grants out to our core partners because they might not have Zoom memberships or laptops to work from home. And so we immediately wired $3,000. And the only question we asked them if we didn't have their banking information because we didn't want to send paper checks um, at that time. Um, and we got, you know, money out to all our partners. And so that was the genesis of what became our Relief and Resilience Fund. And since we had the infrastructure and the ability to act quickly, um, Blue, Blue Shield of California Foundation, one of our partners, along with the endowment and other funders, um, uh, but Blue Shield of California Foundation said, can we partner to get money out to these DV shelters? And so within a matter of weeks, we got grants out to every domestic violence shelter in the state. That's more than 140 organizations um, because the demand was increasing and yet they had less physical space because of physical distancing requirements and so you know we needed to res be responsive to that and we're hopefully going to do another round of grants um, in a couple of weeks but i bring up that um, point because we were really focused on root causes of problems and systems change work which we still are and we hadn't been funding services um, because we recognize that they're important but we said our limited resources are going to go to solving um, the problems, not just providing relief. Um, but in this moment, we said we have to do both. And we pivoted very quickly. We didn't go through a long and drawn out process about you know, whether this makes sense or does it fit within our strategic framework. We just were instinctively responsive in that way. Just building off what Serena was just saying, um, we were fortunate because we'd had, we developed a rapid response grant making process right after the 2016 election. And so we use that for the kind of emergency grants that Serena was referencing that were on the service side and where frankly our donors really stepped up. So we did move some additional resources from our endowment, our donors stepped up, we had institutional funders, and then we could move these grants very rapidly. And Serena, it's interesting because we also saw, um, a, we were not expecting it, but a lot of requests around domestic violence. We were able to move those. We moved lots of grants around housing and food. Uh, and so we're, again, able to use a mechanism that was in place to move quickly. Um, the other thing in terms of what Judy was saying is, you know, we, we started um, a conversation with our board about really what this moment called us uh, to do uh, and started this conversation about increasing our spending policy. Um, over several years uh, to bring more resources in focused on organizing and movement building, recognizing that this moment of enhanced reckoning around racial justice really called the foundation uh, to step up in a different way. And I think because we've been on this journey around racial equity since we, you know, since Fred came in as CEO and since we identified it as our North Star, the board, you know, having been on this journey could dive into the discussion of the moment and step up in a different way. And I'm sure, Judy, you know your story is similar in terms of the board being ready to take such a bold step um, as the social bond. So it does speak right to this, this piece of uh, making sure, you know, we're constantly trying to figure out that gap between where the institution, its board, its staff is, where the, where the field is, and making sure we're not so far behind that when we need to act quickly, the institution and its leadership isn't ready. Yeah, the only thing you know that that sparked for me when um, Serena and Judith were sharing was just around um, really constantly assessing our role and when we are creating um, roadblocks and hindrances versus you know we're really supporting you know what's needed what's needed on the ground. Um, and that that conversation for us in the endowment has been something that um, has been challenging. I'd be lying to say it hasn't been, and it, and it varies um, you know, on a, a couple of circumstances. So what I'm excited about is we are gonna be streamlining our grant making processes writ large. We've seen a tenfold increase in our general operating support um, from last year to, to this year. Um, we have targets to even have more general operating support. Um, and really um, trying to create more space that we also do long-term support. Um, that's that's a hope and aspiration that I, I personally have. 
um, so that that organizations aren't having to do, go through any cycle at all. You know, they can just have the flexibility, autonomy um, that they need. We, we've done a lot of that in our impact investing work where we've, you know, given up to seven, 10 years of funding. Um, to me, I want to see why, why and how we can't do that with our other grant making. We're not there yet. So I want to be very transparent, but that's a hope that, that I hope we can, we can achieve and, and get to. It sounds like in, in, in the situations you've all described that your organization was ready for these bold moves to institute these new approaches because uh, kind of moving in these very different directions can be very challenging, but I don't want to make too many assumptions. So um, what, what convincing did you have to do? What case making did you have to do? How did you kind of uh, help your institutions be, be ready to kind of move in these directions? Um, any advice that you would offer to folks here are going, my organization would never do this. I, I don't even know where I would start. Um, so anyone who wants to pick up that, that question and kind of lead, uh, give uh, their answer perspective, be great. Well, I can just throw out a few things. I'm sure my colleagues will have a lot to add. Uh, one thing I would say, I was referencing this earlier is uh, really recognizing that the board is, is on this journey with us. And so thinking about uh, how to have the board step into racial equity and to think about it both personally, professionally in their role as uh, board members of the foundation. And so we really started that work uh, when we launched the, the, our racial equity, our North Star. Um, and so that made a big difference. And then, you know, we, we knew that we were gonna be asking for these big decisions, these big investments uh, for initiatives. And so we went through a process of figuring out with the board, what was the approval gonna look like? What was that a process? So that they had confidence about when they were gonna be asked, they knew they were gonna be in that process and they understood um, what their role was and how it fit together. We also launched an internal um, committee both to understand right, the rules around lobbying to make sure all of our T's are crossed, our I's are dotted, like we wanna be very careful about that. We have an internal committee around policy and advocacy really wanting staff to be um, deeply invested about what policy and systems change is about and the roles we can play. And then finally, for these big investments that I was talking about, we had a pooled fund uh, around lobbying. And so our leadership was coming together, staff was coming together to decide the best use of those resources. And so that allowed us both to have um, difficult conversations to ask really pressing questions of each other it meant that we all felt like the resources were being put to the best use. And that then we, when we went to the board for support, we had that broader foundation internally uh, where we felt like um, everyone was all in. We also did um, staff sessions to let people know why we were doing this work, how it was attached to our North Star and how they could get involved individually if they wanted to as well. Yeah, I, I would just add um, that for us, you know, as I said earlier, some of this was so instinctive and I think comes out of our feminist practices. And so we made the changes. I think we had, you know, we have an organizational culture, um, both on the board and the team that, you know, involves a lot of trust. And so the board trusted us. Uh, and so we kept them informed. We never really asked for permission about the changes that we were making. We kept them informed. Um, in fact, if anything, we opened up our board meetings uh, because the board wanted to know in the early days of the pandemic, how is the staff doing? And the staff wanted to know, how is the board being informed? So in our spirit of doing things business as unusual, we said, well, we have an executive committee of the board every month. Let's open it up to the whole staff and the whole board. You know, we're a smaller organization. There's 19 of us currently and we'll grow this year a bit. Um, uh, but, you know, we were able to basically accommodate everyone and it built community. Um, and I think that that's what's really important um, to be able to make these changes. We did then, you know, the, the board program committee did change their um, uh, approval process so that grants now of um, $50,000 and under are approved by me and the staff, and then we keep the board informed. Uh, larger grants go to the board program committee, but not the full board anymore. And so that's another way to streamline so that we can be really responsive. The other thing that I wanted to say is that we were, you know, we were 
ready for this moment in so many ways because we have been for 42 years um, since our founding in 1979 trying to tackle this problem that still exists which is that a pittance of philanthropic money, 1.6% goes to gender justice issues. And so we knew early on also that the, the pandemic was so gendered that um, essential workers are primarily women, the, the sectors that were laying people off, care work, um, restaurant work were primarily women of color. And we already knew this because we live in a state which has the greatest wealth in the country, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, and we have the highest rates of poverty. And who's living in poverty is women of color and their kids. And so all of our work, you know, what I want to say to the philanthropic sector is that it's so important to work on racial equity as we do at the Women's Foundation of California, but you can't work on racial equity without looking at gender equity um, and vice versa. And so that's where we really um, were able to make those connections that the you know 80% of the healthcare workforce is women so our essential workers our grocery workers the you know are primarily women and yet women you know we know from just reading the headlines that you know the December jobs report for example it was 100% women of color who lost their jobs or left the workforce and so that those are the kinds of um, solutions we need to be looking for in terms of really centering women of color Do you do you want me to jump in? I'm just looking at time. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I want to acknowledge that um, for us, you know, on the bond in particular, um, you know, Dr. Ross was willing to put his sort of credibility on the line um, to ask the board for this request. Um, and, and so it took, it took a lot of leadership from, from him, but I also just want to acknowledge all the hard work of my colleagues um, across the foundation, you know, who've really been really pushing us to change our practices, whether it be um, building our own um, uh, experience, competency, and approach around racial justice, um, led by my colleague Lauren Fadiev out there today, or whether it's been, you know, really how we show up in community um, and, and build those relationships and trust. So I think it was a combination of different things. I think in terms of, if I were to risk, um, rate the, the endowment's risk tolerance level, if 10 was, you know, if, if I, we could go over 10, we'd probably go over 10. Um, and we are also constantly sort of up against, you know, what is, you know, what is within our fiduciary responsibility, our legal obligations. And so I think we're, we're doing a scrub right now to assess that. But I feel from a staff um, level, we were ready to do that. The board, um, we have new, new leadership. We have um, new, new, seven new board members actually starting this week. Um, so, you know, we will continue to um, really look at the long game while we're looking at what needs to change um, here and now. And I think we're, you know, we're, we'll try different things all the time and we need to really pause, reflect, and at the end of the day, not how it benefits the, us, how does it actually benefit partners? Um, and that those are really um, the metrics that should matter at, at, you know, ultimately and what's making it easier and better so they can do the work. Um, that they they want to do and they're inspired to do and they should be doing. So you know those are things that we have to get better at. But that's that's um, we were ready and we're, we we like to take risk and we know that that's not necessarily a, there's not a high appetite for that for for some of our colleagues. Yeah, although I think it's not unrealistic to think about the role philanthropy can play as sort of risk capital, if you will. You know, sort of trying out things, attempting things. So there was a question that's come up um, from the audience. Uh, what advice do you have for nonprofit leaders in terms of uh, how they can help their foundation partners adopt some of the practices you all have talked about? Well, uh, Serena, did you want to go? I see you're off mute. I, I mean, I would just say talk to them. You know, philanthropy, like every, you know, much else in this world, is relational. And so um, we take deep pride and uh, you know in building relationships with our partners. And I always know that we're doing a good job when our partners come to us with their problems uh, and not just their successes. Because again, we're trained. I mean, we know as we're both a grant seeking institution and a grant making institution. And so, um, you know, we, we know the challenges um, that we have to go through in terms of accessing funding. And so we wanna be that leader in the field that doesn't 
make um, organizations jump through a lot of hoops that are unnecessary. Um, and that's a growing, um, you know, sentiment, I think, in the sector. And so what I would say is, you know, build that relationship and, and tell the truth and as hard as that might be to do. Yeah, I, I would just add, I totally agree with everything Serena just said. I would just add that, you know, there can be obstacles uh, that we won't know about unless folks tell us, right? Because it could be in our systems and our ways that uh, our grantees are navigating. We don't even know that they're having to navigate. So yes to everything Serena said. And then frankly, it's just so helpful uh, to both hear what people need, what grantees need and how we can uh, be, be better and be more supportive. And then to know where we're messing up uh, and where it's not working in the way that we would hope it would be working. So yes, to, to talking and then for our role to be listening and then acting to solve those problems. Judy, did you want to get in here? Or... No, I think, you know, as a, as a funder um, and a former grant seeker, you know, it's, it's really shifting the orientation of, um, I'm, I, I work at a foundation, but I'm accountable to you. Um, and just emphasizing that that notion of, of really fostering um, relationships does require trust and honesty. And um, it, it's just really, um, you have to expect that both ways. And, and so like, I think it's just really important that 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 nonprofit partners and, and leaders just feel like they can say things that maybe hurt or sting, but you're doing it in the spirit of really, what are we trying to do here? This isn't just about seeking a grant. This is about really changing um, my community or, or an issue, so. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. So I have one more formal question, but before I, I, I do that, I want to invite our audience to put your questions in the chat. And I know I have a lot of friends on here, so I'm gonna call you out, Jody and CJ and Richard, um, uh, among others. Uh, so if you have questions, <laughs> they're no longer my friends. Um, if you have questions, anyone have questions, please put, put them in the, in the chat here. Um, I mean, one of the concerns of course, is that as we, kind of wind down, if we are winding down from the from this pandemic, as time goes on, it's just a lot of concern about retrenchment, of us going back to those old ways of doing things. So how do we sustain and broaden the kind of bold approaches that you've all talked about? How do we make them just part of our everyday practice and not new and unusual and response to a crisis? Any advice that you would offer insights? Well, we started asking ourselves as a team, again, early on, um, uh, of what we're doing now, what do we want to carry into the future? We also knew, you know, that, you know, we, we said early on, we're not going back to normal. Normal was not good. If anything, this pandemic has, you know, really put a spotlight on all the inequities that were here before. Uh, and so, you know, we want to move forward. So for us, you know, in addition to all the things that I've talked about, we also made a decision, Steve, I see you're in the lovely NCG office, which I love so much. Um, we gave up our office during this time um, and really embraced being a virtual organization. Uh, and for some of our team, you know, we talked about it. We use the Zoom polls, you know, to sort of do a pulse check every once in a while. And for the majority of us, we, you know, said we, we, we want want to continue working at home. But for some of the team, they were, you know, sad about leaving this the office behind. And so my advice to them was, you know, let's not focus on what we're leaving behind, but what we're walking towards. And so what do we want this future to look like? So we have, you know, embraced a a, a campaign for a feminist future for California. So when we did our relief and resilience fund and partnered with a number of funders, and then the governor's office reached out to us and said, can we have a private partner, you know, private partnership? And that was precipitated by us saying to the governor's office in the early days that, you know, you can't say that everybody is safer at home. Not everybody is safer at home. We need this message to be nuanced. Um, and so, you know, we then entered into a partnership with the governor's office uh, around, 
you know, increasing resources to domestic violence organizations. And so really thinking about that, that and, and for us, it wasn't, they asked us like, are all the resources gonna go to DV? And we said, no, because there are, we need to have a long-term view. We're addressing the short-term needs, but we, you know, when the fires hit, when the movement for Black Lives Uprising started, we increased our support to Black-led organizations, to climate justice organizations, to civic participation organizations leading up to the election. Um, and now we really want to have a long-term view about what does a feminist California look like in terms of practices and policies, particularly given um, you know, the immense resources and surplus that the state has. And so legislators are reaching out to us to say, you know, what are the kinds of things that we need to put in the budget? And so the May revise from the governor's office looks great. Um, and there are additional things um, that we think that need to go in there, like more resources for childcare and more resources for DV prevention. And um, so we'll be making that case. But I think, you know, I think the question to ask is of what we're doing now, what do we want to carry into the future? We're not going to go back to the way things were, because, again, one of the issues that this pandemic has really, for me, um, you know, just made so clear is that we are operating within um, structures and systems that were built upon white supremacy and patriarchy. Um, and so we really need to look at that and dismantle it everywhere we see it. Thank you, Serena. Judy? Judy? Yeah, just a, a couple things I would add. One is um, completely agree that the that the work now is to create a future we haven't seen, right? Because the the past was nothing that we were lifting up and saying that um, we want to go back to that. So what? So given that, like, how do we create a future that really is about um, the racial equity that we're talking about today? Um, the you know Serena's points about gender equity as well, because of uh, what we know from COVID and from what we know from hundreds of years of experience. Uh, and I think for us, that has meant uh, really uh, thinking through what the recovery can offer in terms of greater equity, how we can bring our region together and speak um, in one voice so that as resources begin to move, they're moved uh, with greater equity, they're moved to the organizations that represent that, the organizations that are grounded in community and that are focused on the kind of efforts that need to be underway for the future to look differently. And then, then I would say, you know, from a movement building perspective, we're involved um, in an effort called PIVOT, which stands for Powerful Innovations for Voter Organizing and Transformation. The reason I lift that up is because it's a, it's a partnership between movement builders and funders. And it's really based on the idea that funders need to act differently and we need to be in, in partnership and we need to be in conversation and in relationship in a different way um, with the movement field and that we need to be thinking about the medium and the long term and not just the immediate campaigns that come up you know, cyclically. And so that really has led to a conversation about what's the infrastructure that's needed right, to get to that brighter future to advance racial equity. What are the functions that need to be supported? You know, what are the, the people? What's a people piece? And um, what's the what are the um, elements within foundations, the actions, and then for that matter, the things like HR and communications that have to be built up and need to be there then built up in a different way for when those campaigns emerge. And so I think um, that brighter future is about that partnership. It is about the different kinds of relationships we've been talking about this morning. Uh, and that will help us to make a different future than if we go back to what wasn't a particularly bright past. Right. Judy, anything you want to add? Yeah, and I'll answer the question on the chat since you <laughs> you called out someone too. Because I, I, I yeah, because I think Richard's question actually illuminates a little bit of what you were asking, which is, you know, I think um, we can say we want to change, or we can actually do things differently to change. Um, and I think that's really going to be the test for for us all as we as we move forward. And that's going to be, um, you know, for for us. I'll just speak for for the endowment. You know the words we say and the commitments we actually, um, you know, follow through with, um, you know, is, is really going to be important, you know, really how we show up in, in our right role as a funder. Um, it, it should not um, be in that lead role. 
and, and really sort of, um, you know, those are things that we're going to have to change. I think we haven't grappled, Serena, with some of the things like we haven't gone um, full virtual yet. Um, I think we're all waiting. I'm a, a single mom with two kids. Like, what? How the heck am I going to do that? So we're gonna we're gonna figure all of that out um, in terms of um, you know how we come back, uh, vir you know, virtually or not. But really, I think paying attention to the needs of staff and understanding that this isn't just about being at home. This has uprooted everyone's sort of realities, um, staff and 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 the like. Um, so we we have to grapple with that. Um, we will change our grant making um, policies and practices and processes. Um, I'm really looking for that is something that we've committed to before um, last year, but I think now we have more um, support uh, to really make those shifts. And um, so I'm excited about that. But continue, the things we want to continue to do more of is build stronger relationships with trust um, and, and really moving our, our racial equity work. Um, and, and when I say that, Serena, I do mean gender equity too, because we, we have to acknowledge patriarchy is alive and well, um, even as we say the words racial equity. Um, so, you know, those are things that we want to, we want to do more of, and it's going to be more of what are the actions we take um, and how do we sort of shift what we need versus what partners need. And that goes for the evaluation too, um, you know, endless reports, <laughs> endless evaluation, theories of change, theories of action, whatever, you know, evaluation frameworks, those, those all things we have to really go, is that, is that worthwhile? And is that how we want to utilize our resources and prioritize the time of partners that is so precious? I think we all have to grapple with that. I mean, I think what Richard's question also lifts up is um, how might we codify, if you will, what we learn from the work that we do in partnership with grantees. And for a lot of folks, they have, they still the accountability question comes into play. How, you know, how do we, you know, indicate that our investment and what we did and the work we did actually made a difference, actually, you know, got at the issues that we're concerned about. So what do you say to folks who are, you know, grappling with that? I think we have to really embrace a culture of storytelling. Um, you know, we, we need to tell the stories of where change is happening. And we know if people's lives are actually changing and they can tell us how, um, whether it's about some of the policy changes that we've been advocating for or the organizing work that we've been doing. I mean, there's lots of ways that we can kind of add up um, the change that's taking place, understanding that these are multi-generational issues that we are working on. And so we also have to be um, patient uh, in terms of the kind of work that, you know, we're, we're seeking to have. And so I think that the culture change piece is something that I just want to bring up here because it's important, you know, many of us have been funding um, advocacy, organizing, coalition building, strategic communications. Those are all really important. We have a theory that if we overlay culture change with that and really begin to work with movement um, leaders and connect them to artists and culture change makers that we will um, accelerate change. And we actually saw that last summer in um, the movement for Black Lives Uprising when um, one of our culture change grant partners, Harness, um, convened uh, you know hundreds of celebrities over Zoom in these salons who wanted to do something around the issues of the day in terms of investing in community and not in in police forces and so you know the this this hashtag defund the police no matter what people want to say about it um, became mainstream people um, you know knew what it was and that was because you saw um, a number of celebrities hand over their social media platforms to activists like Alicia Garza and others. And so it raised the volume, it elevated the issue. And that is the perfect example of culture change. And so if you want to put, you know, um, sort of an evaluative framework to it, you can see that change is happening. Um, and so I think evaluation can happen in a lot of ways. I've had a lot of good experiences with that in terms of, you know, seeing how things can change, but I think it has to be done in, in partnership and, you um, and um, in a way that works for the organizations. Um, and so I think, again, we have to ask, 
what do you need? What would be helpful to you in terms of um, figuring out whether the work that you're doing is having a tangible effect? Anyone else want to respond to that one? I mean, I, I think, you know, given the, uh, the great debate conversation that preceded us, um, you know, I think it's also is the valuation about validating our role as philanthropy, or is it really about what, what changes we want to see in conditions and communities for people? And, you know, I think that that shift is going to be important um, for us because it can't be about we're contributing in this way and we're, we're it's, it's, it's important. Our role, our role is valued. That just reinforce, reinforces patriarchy, white supremacy and all of those things. So I think we have to really look closely about why are we doing the evaluation um, and what is it that we actually ultimately want to change and see. So it's just a question, I think, um, for, for all of us to grapple with. One of the things, I, uh, Judith, because you talked about um, you know, working with movement leaders and sitting at the table with movement leaders, and, and it's really it struck me about the challenge that philanthropy often has uh, about sitting at the table and, and paying attention to its own power and role as it sits at the table. Um, and so I'm curious, both, yeah, we'd love to hear from you about how you do that, um, how you've seen it done successfully, and what folks need to kind of keep in mind as they're sitting at, at the table with others. Uh, because even though I think a lot of folks give voice to it, a lot of folks don't do it very well. It's a challenge. So, Judith, we'd love to hear from you, but also, you know, if other folks have, have perspectives on this, uh, I think that would be helpful because it feels like it's very important as we kind of make these shifts and do things differently. Yeah, I think it's um, so important. I mean, it came up again in the great debate. I think it's so much about listening and listening at a, at a deeper level and recognizing just how, how that power dynamic is present, e even when you don't think it is. Uh, it, it's just there. And so it, it increases the responsibility of a funder to be listening and to be in a mode of constantly asking, is this a moment where my voice will add value? Uh, and if so, what kind of value really can help this process move forward? Uh, I think the, the other thing is uh, to be um, in those spaces with people that you have confidence will let you know when you've overstepped, you know, will actually in, in these conversations, I would just say, because the Pivot Steering Committee has been together now for a while, uh, you can raise the question about uh, too many funder voices and needing to bring the field voices forward um, or asking the question about, um, about the powers. We're starting to think about whether we should create a fund, Well, what does it look like to make decisions? Where does that responsibility sit? Is it too much of a burden on movement builders just to change their power dynamics. Like what those kinds of questions I think uh, are, are important and get to those fundamental underlying dynamics that if we're not paying attention to with uh, intentionality are actually still present and are muddying the waters. Uh, so I, I do think it is fundamentally about listening, about bringing deep levels of humility and about constantly like checking yourself, checking the, the group and uh, asking and welcoming the hard questions and then struggling right in the middle of those questions. And, and you know, I'd say equally as a white person in this work, right, then there's a whole another set of questions that I need to be asking myself and need to be bringing into those dynamics and bringing into those groups. And so one last thing I would say, Serena was pointing to, right, the dynamics around gender. How do those play out? How do the dynamics around race play out? How do you make sure that voices and leaders are being seen and heard? Um, and how do you hold yourself responsible for that as well? Yeah, I love all of that, Judith. And I, I and I'm just looking at the chat, and uh, my colleague Jane Lynn, I think, asks a very good question, which is, you know, what would it look like if we, you know, switch the accountability um, question and evaluation questions and grant partners, movement leaders asked it of philanthropy, and I think that's the kind of partnership 
that we need. And I will say as a grant, you know, us as a grant seeker and a grant maker, there was a time when we used to host giving circles at the Women's Foundation California, and um, a couple of them were interested in funding our Women's Policy Institute. So we were in this very unusual position of having to go through our own grant process um, to get that funding. And so our development team was just like, are you kidding me? Is this what we make our grant partners go through in terms of the budget template and the reporting requirements and the you know, it was just like a lot to go through. And so that was the first, this was years ago. That was our first, you know, um, kind of like eye-opening aha moment that we really need to change. And so it was said in the great debate, like I think Pia said that, you know, we're, we're building our practices after the first foundation that was established in 1906. And I remember the days I've been in philanthropy now for a long time where we would request applications you know many of them would get turned down but we would request applications um you know uh and we would say no more than this many words and staple it in the left hand corner and make it double-sided and then send us 13 copies so that we don't have to stand at the photocopy machine um and it just you know that that is like the absolute wrong way to do things um and so we really need to be centering um our movement leaders and giving them the, the time they need to be working on these intractable problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and so any hour that is spent um, on, you know, accessing funding, especially if it's de de declined, um, I just cringe and think about all the movement hours that are lost um, because we are, you know, making people apply for grants and then potentially declining a lot of them. Yeah, you're, 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 you're taking me back. <laughs> That's, that unfortunately is what happened way too often. Uh, Judy, any, anything you wanted to add before I go on to this other question? That's a lot of excitement about in the chat. No, go to the next question. Okay. Please go ahead. So uh, to be provocative, how comfortable would foundations be with significant staff reductions and diminishment of roles to reflect the fact that they are not at the center and so many of the processes need to be eliminated and ultimately that's not all about them and their soul searching and internal processes. Um, any, any perspective on that? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll go, um, you know, and again, I'll take the, this is my opinion, <laughs> maybe <laughs> not, the, not that of my employer. Um, you know, I think we really, uh, those are tensions, right? We're saying we want to build trust and relationships and, and then we want to have streamlined processes and they're, they're a bit of a, they're tensions and contradictions. Um, so I just want to like be honest about that. I think we really um, try to be very judicious with our admin costs and our, in our resources. Um, and that's something that, but we have to acknowledge that. Do we fundamentally need to go away and really create um, you know, ways that we just get resources, again, for multiple years, that's general operating, in particular to organizing and base building groups. Um, and that's, that's a live question that we need to, um, you know, we, we are struggling with. And then what does that mean in terms of really, you know, seeding our power? Um, because regardless of what you say, we do have a, we, we do have power and privilege um, in this role. And I think as staff, we're constantly um, pushing ourselves and, and being challenged by partners like you say you want to support us and this is what we get and so we we have to kind of just own that I think as a foundation we we um, just went through a restructure on this during a pandemic it was really interesting um, and so I, I don't know that we'll fundamentally change our staffing ratios right now but I think why not put it on the table I mean, I think we have to really go, where does where do our resources go and, and what's the purpose of, of, of the resources that we have that we get to steward? Um, but that's me. And so I'm sure I have others in my, in colleagues of mine who have different opinions, but we, we haven't grappled with that. But fundamentally it's about seeding power and um, our role in decision-making. And do we actually have significant trust to support our organizations for the long haul? Yeah, I completely agree with what Judy was saying about power. I think it's a great provocative question. And I do think um, in addition to the multi-year grants and the larger grants, like that has been a journey for the San Francisco Foundation to realize the field really wants larger grants and they're willing to 
understand that fewer grants will go out, but larger grants have it just allows you to actually do the work and not spend the time raising additional dollars. And then the other thing I'd say, these are all steps towards that provocative question, um, is thinking about uh, how, like rather than holding, rather than the foundation funding the research, giving the resources to groups to then fund the research or fund the evaluation so that we're ceding the power of that piece of the work so that the groups themselves are either individually or as a collective are answering those questions. We've done that in some of our narrative change work uh, where you know, we've given the resources, the groups have identified an anchor org and they're holding those dollars and they're making those decisions. And I think that really is seeing the power. Another example is the work we're doing with the Bay Area Equity Atlas where the groups are working with the Atlas both to identify the next data that needs to be analyzed and thinking about the context of how that data can help them in campaigns. So those are smaller steps, but I do think if we're asking this question about seeding the power that then goes along with seeding the resources, it does begin to have the institution asking those questions about staffing and capacity and where it belongs. Sabrina, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. I think Catherine's question here is, um, both provocative and very popular. Um, and so I would just say that, um, you know, foundations are different, right? Each foundation, of course, is different, but there's different categories in terms of private foundations, family foundations, and public foundations. So, you know, I would be supportive of this idea of, you know, um, really looking at um, our own organizations and are we centered on supporting movement building? And so if there is, if that means that staff reductions are part of that, um, you know, I think that's something important to look at. I used, I worked at the Ford Foundation. It was a 450 person organization um, uh, to, to, you know, to get out 400 at that time, $450 million. So if you think about it, you know, that's a million dollars per person that's going out the, in terms of the people power. Um, this is all inclusive in terms of the facility staff and everything, but still we're a 19 person um, organization. And I think if anything, we're not going to reduce staff. We're going to um, probably increase our staff because we do more than just grant making. We're doing policy training. And we also want to advocate within the philanthropic field to get more money to gender, racial, and economic justice. And so, um, so our staff is in support and in service um, of movement makers and movement builders. Great. Thank you, Serena, uh, for that. Um, we're, we are about uh, at the end of time. So um, I want to know if you all have any kind of final thoughts, anything you really weren't able to touch upon uh, during the course of the conversation before we wrap up. You know, I, I think, you know, really, um, you know, given the sort of basis of, of this panel and, and, and how we started the conversation is you have to be ready for doing the long-term work and it is work and it's gonna be um, uncomfortable and it's gonna be messy. And I think, you know, really doing the, um, the discernment and assessment of like, what are you actually, what's the appetite you have um, at the staff level, the board level to do some of the things you, you wanna do. Um, because I think at the end of the day, it hurts partners on the ground. Um, and then I would just say, you know, when you're doing, um, you know, making big changes, you, you have to have that orientation of what do these shifts actually mean um, for, for longer term um, strategy and, and approach that you have as an organization. So, you know, just be, be ready for the uncomfortable times, um, you know, really being supportive of, of your colleagues um, and partners um, to do that work. So that's all I'd say. Thanks everyone, really appreciate this time with you. I would just add that it's all about you know, walking the walk and not just talking the talk. And if you've ever trained for anything, you know, where you're going to put, you have to push your body, it is about training and there's, there's pain along the way. Uh, but, you know, the pain sort of builds a sense of resilience and allows you to do more. And I think that is what this work is about, both the fight for racial equity and the work with grantees, right, to figure out over and over again, what does it mean to be in a trusting relationship? What do, what do I need to bring? What does my institution need to bring? What do I need to push my institution to do differently? How can I be in that listening stance? 
And so I think if we think about it as the long game, and if we think about like, what is it over the long haul that we want to be known for? Um, and how do we want to sort of have our institution be known for those same values? Then, then we're in the right dance. And yes, we'll be uncomfortable along the way, but it's all in service to reaching those goals. Yeah, I'll just add two quick things. One is just ask, always ask the question, who benefits and who loses? Um, and then secondly, you know, I, I really am committed to joyfulness. And so I want this work to be filled with joy. In fact, I mean, I think that's what we're all working towards. And so I really, you know, push myself um, and encourage our team to take an appreciative inquiry approach to say, you know, rather than looking for what's missing, look for what we have built and then how can we um you know build upon that uh so we, we're kind of trained to sort of look for you know to be critical and to say well you know it's it's good but you didn't think about these three things and so i think that to, to say you know this is good for these reasons and how can we make it better thank you serena i want to thank all of our panelists um for their terrific comments this morning we're, we're giving you a virtual standing ovation here. Um, and the, the, the next session is gonna start at noon. Um, and so with our membership meeting, so we invite you to come back for that. And we will have other sessions uh, happening in the fall and later on um, that lift up some of the themes you heard today um, through our Better California efforts. So please stay tuned. Um, Check out our Better California page and thank you all for joining us today.